And welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the busy intersection of faith and reason. Getting busier every day. I'm Doug Keck, directing traffic. Uh, your email questions are important to us at SpitzersUniversity, W10.com. That helps to drive the program. And of course, check out Father Spitzer's Magis Center website, IncredibleCatholic.com, for all things Father Spitzer. The show is always available on EWTN On Demand and on our YouTube channel, so check those out if you miss any portion of the program, as you can see on your screen. And of course, our topic, Jesus' Defeat of Satan in the Temptations in the Desert from Father's wonderful book, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives, available naturally through the EWTN Religious Catalog, EWTNRC.com, as well as the Book of the Month for June, Jesus, the Master Psychologist, Listen to Him, by the one and only Dr. Ray Garendi. You know there's some interesting insights in this book, so check it out through EW10 Publishing. We're proudly making it available, and we're proud once again to join the one and only Father Spitzer out on the West Coast, who's going to kick things off with a, a prayer. Thank you, Father. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, the blessing of this ministry, the blessing of this audience, all that we're able uh, to do within our culture and for our church. We ask you, Lord, to send your Holy Spirit down upon us now to inspire, guide, and protect us so that everything we do will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, uh, obviously, we've just come out of the Bishop's Conference. There's been a lot of news, obviously, about Eucharistic co mm -hmm. coherency. Uh, and a couple of articles I want to get to your, your comments on. One sure. was uh, an article was written about uh, some discussion that happened on The View of all programs. And I guess uh, one of the uh, people on the program, uh, McCain, uh, talked about the idea of saying that that she believed abortion was murder and saw federal funding for abortions as a red line for herself and a lot of people who were pro-life. And, uh, and she talked about the idea that when it comes to the separation of church and state, the onus is on the government and not on the church for that separation. And she went on to say, I'm personally opposed to murder, but if you want to murder a little bit, it's fine because it's not my problem. That's the attitude a lot of people have. So it was interesting to see that. But her co-host on the show, mm -hmm. uh, Sunny Hostin, like, who I believe, I guess, she says, how about me? Mm -hmm. I'm a devout Catholic. I went through infertility, conceived my children through IF, IVF. Should I not receive communion? Hopefully this is much to do about nothing, but I remain very, very disappointed in the Catholic Church getting involved in something like this. I just thought it was interesting uh, that she brought that issue in there as well. Now, obviously, there are some issues with that as well. What's your take? Well, you know, in vitro fertilization, I think a lot of couples think that it is a totally innocent procedure. And unfortunately, they don't realize what is involved in it. That's in vitro fertilization is IVF. Right. And what they don't realize is that it really does involve uh, the abortion or the killing of a, a lot of embryos in the process. Uh, it, it happens in two stages. First of all, you have to fertilize a lot of eggs. And then, of course, you're trying to select uh, a few of them for implantation um, that, um, uh, you know, will, you know, be likely to survive. So um, there's not just going to be a single selection, but several of them. And then the rest of those fertilized embryos are disposed of, mm -hmm. and, um, or they are kept on ice uh, one way or another and perhaps later disposed mm -hmm. of. But the point is that's the first stage of problems. The second stage is in many IVF cases, since several um, of these fertilized eggs are implanted, uh, one of the things that um, has to be done, if mm -hmm. uh, let's say the woman only wants one child, is then they have to select the child, um, the, the one that's going to survive. So this could be as late as, you know, the fetal heartbeat, mm -hmm. uh, you know, has already started in those other children. But those other children not being quote unquote wanted um, are um, well disposed of uh, by generally some form of potassium cyanide or something that's injected uh, into their hearts. And of course that causes a another abortion 
uh, you know, to, to occur or several abortions uh, to occur at the same time. So this procedure, I, I know it seems like a great liberation uh, for couples to be able to conceive of, of children, but uh, right now uh, the procedure itself uh, has a lot of flaws in it, uh, especially all of these abortions that are almost entailed by the process itself. Mm -hmm. So the church is saying, my gosh, if we really do believe that from the point of fertilization onward, you have a human being, if that's really the case, mm -hmm. then uh, I mean, what we're doing here is uh, we can't basically applaud uh, multiple abortions in order to give uh, help uh, you know uh, uh, um, uh, a couple have mm -hmm. their own children it is far 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 better to adopt uh, children uh, rather than to uh, abort all these uh, uh, human beings in order to have your own children the, the process simply is flawed right now and uh, right there's no way of really getting around it uh, unless you just want to um, try a single um, uh, well, I, I've never heard of a single, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, egg being fertilized, and I certainly haven't heard of a single egg. Uh, be, well, I have heard of a single egg uh, attempted to be implanted, mm -hmm. but by far the majority of of, um, of those procedures have multiple eggs, and mm -hmm. and then of course the other fetuses are, quote unquote, taken care of, mm -hmm. and so um, that's um, that's the problem, and mm -hmm. um, it's. Uh, it's not a little bit of murder um, it's just mm -hmm. murder right. and so um, that uh, is the the problem and the church is never ever going to applaud it and the church absolutely has to be against it right. because you're killing innocent human beings and I think there's every reason to believe that a single-celled human zygote is definitely a human being mm -hmm. it's got a full unique, specifically human genome that's present. That genome has everything that is going to determine all of the major factors, uh, physical factors uh, that belong to a child, um, you know, and all the way through the, mm -hmm. the stage of adulthood in it. Now, of course, there are other epigenetic factors uh, that are also included, but by and large, the genetic factors themselves are already there fully for that specific human being fully present. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is the, uh, the human zygote itself, the, the zygote is not like any other cell, like a skin cell in the human body. A human zygote is the cell that will give rise to every single cell that will develop from that human being from the moment of conception all the way through uh, from the moment of fertilization all the way through uh, its adulthood and mm -hmm. finally uh, through its uh, to its death mm -hmm. so the, or his or her death so the the key point is that is in potentia mm -hmm. every single cell no the unification of every single cell that will occur uh, throughout the course of the the existence mm -hmm. of that human being so uh, w why it wouldn't it be th the human being mm -hmm. the the, the uh, you know it's a, a complete artificial separation there and by the way the majority of embryological um, uh, textbooks uh, indicate that the moment of fertilization mm -hmm. is in fact the moment at which a new human being occurs. Now there are of course uh, you know people for political purposes try mm -hmm. to draw the line but the embryological textbooks pretty much say it as it is and I have a, this new book that's coming out The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church A Defense of Her Controversial Moral Teachings uh, coming out I guess around July or so um, uh, from Ignatius Press. That uh, book in, in uh, chapter 3 uh, does give a very mm -hmm. full explanation of that uh, human zygote and mm -hmm. the full human genome, the impotentia of every cell and the integration right. of every cell in that human being. So uh, right. if you want all that, and plus all the embryological textbook sources that identified the beginning of uh, a unique human being at uh, fertilization. Right, and then it's important that uh, everybody realizes that. If many people might go into it yeah. without realizing th that's exactly mm -hmm. what's going on or not having it presented in that way, so we have to keep that in mind because the end does not justify the means, otherwise there's yeah. lots of other things that we could uh, 
you know, come sure. up with and justify later and has been in the past. He, along those mm -hmm. same lines, um, uh, Ross Dothat, who writes usually for the New York Times, kind of an interesting writer, makes the point mm -hmm. that uh, in dealing with some of the political where there's been, well, why is this becoming a political issue with the president, uh, president and uh, being a devout Catholic, quote unquote, um, he says there's just too little daylight now between secular t utilitarianism and liberal Catholicism in its political and partisan form. He goes on to say, there are many good reasons to avoid a political confrontation over communion abortion right now. Many reasons to expect that any effort will backfire or just fail. He said, but if over the next few generations we move into a world where the liberalism of Catholic politicians requires them to support not just abortion rights, but a brave new world of human life manufactured, commodified, vivisected, and casually snuffed out. Well, then the bishops may look back and say, maybe we should have done it sooner. Yeah, well, that was, uh, I, I don't remember the, the name of the person who, uh, who said this, but he was a Lutheran pastor mm -hmm. um, who uh, basically declared uh, after you know the concentration camp experience and his own eventual placement mm -hmm. in the concentration camps, you know, first they came uh, for the labor organizers, mm -hmm. but I, I wasn't a labor organizer, so I didn't say anything about it. And then they came for the socialists, but I wasn't a socialist, so I didn't say anything about it. And then they came for the Jews, but I, I wasn't Jewish, so I, I didn't say anything about it. And then, last of all, they came for me. But um, there was no one left to defend me. Mm -hmm, right. And of course, he wound up being in the concentration camps. And, and again, this is the whole point. If you let this get off, you know, and, and you, know, you try to make it some kind of a quantifiable mm -hmm. or some kind of a, a diceable thing instead of it's either yes or no. And in this case, if it's murder, it's no. I mean, if you don't draw the line at actually murdering mm -hmm. a, a human being that just happens to be a single-celled human zygote, and by the way, it's not just single-celled human zygotes that are being murdered, it's also uh, all the way up until the time of birth, and actually, in partial birth, uh, mm -hmm. that is still permitted with, uh, you know, the, 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 the head of the fetus already exposed, uh, but they can still be, of course, uh, uh, killed at that juncture according to the law. Now, if you're supporting this uh, in, in, in any form, I mean, what's to prevent all of these other things from happening, as the uh, New York Times author is saying? Mm -hmm. I mean, what's to prevent it from happening? Uh, it, you know, if we're sanctioning this, well, wh where are we going to stop? But it's not really sanctioning just this. The point is, murder is murder is murder. You can try and slice it and dice it to justify it politically. But at the end of the day, it's still murder. Mm -hmm. And so you got to stop it at the beginning. Uh, it's not just going to be the, you know, the labor organizers. It's not just going to be the socialists. This thing is just going to keep on going mm -hmm. if we let it uh, go. But it's not the slippery slope. It, 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 that's, of course, an eventual outcome that should be discouraged mm -hmm. and, and recognized and discouraged. But that's not the, the whole point. The point is, it's murder now. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have to go down the slippery slope. Murder yeah. should be avoided because it's murder. And we got to stop trying to justify it at any stage. I mean, it's just the same thing with slavery. You know, we, we see the very same, uh, it's not just a slippery right. slope, but the point is, these people are subhuman. And of course, when Bartolome de las Casas tries to stop it, when the abolitionists try to stop them, they say, mm -hmm. no, these people are not subhuman. Th these people are real human beings. Absolutely. If you just allow them to develop, if you uh, just recognize their rational capacity right now, that they are singularly spiritual, they're singularly linguistic, mm -hmm. they have all the capacities to, 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 to master mathematics in, 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 in every imaginable way, they're human beings. If it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. And, and so the point, of course, is people try to say, ah, ah, it's not so much what they can do. It's not so much, you know, the, the way they are. It's, wait a minute, it's what they're not. 
you know, they haven't reached the same degree of civilization that we have. Mm -hmm. Look at their educational system. It's just not up to par. And look at the kinds mm -hmm. of buildings that they built. It's just right. not up to par. Exactly. And they're emphasizing all these knots. But all these knots, with a little bit of education and time, would be completely overcome. Right. But what's happening is, right now, in the abortion movement, just as we saw in slavery, is instead of looking at what the human being is, they're trying to look at what they're not. Ah, they're not fully developed. Well, that's exactly what the, 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 the slavery advocate said. Aha! See, they're subhumans because they have not reached the same degree of education. They have not reached the same degree of architecture. And therefore, because we can see these knots, they're not fully human. And uh, as we yeah. saw, s slavery was justified, slavery of real human beings, and they were reduced, of course, uh, to chattel slavery, to property, uh, essentially. And when that happened, we all know the mm -hmm. consequence. Uh, it did cause a civil war here, an abolitionist right. movement. But thank God for it all, because it stopped the outrage. And we've got to stop the outrage where it starts, and the argument that it always begins with is a negative argument, a not argument. They're not fully human, mm -hmm. but they are the full put, they are the full potential of a human being. They mm -hmm. are a full human, specifically unique uh, 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 human genome. They are, uh, you know, at least a, a, a zygote which will be, give rise to every single cell in that body for the rest of that human being's existence. Instead of looking at the R's, they're all looking at right. the not. And those knots are not fully defining because those knots are merely historical accidents. And those the same justification was used for slavery and produces the same kind of outrage. Mm -hmm. And it should have stopped where it began. And by the way, the Catholic Church spoke out against slavery just as much as it spoke out ag against abortion. And they were hated by many mm -hmm. for saying that. Right. But at the same time, they stuck to it, and eight encyclicals later, and of course in this country, a civil war, we finally right. started you know, to, to correct uh, this horrible, horrible outrage. Well, maybe we should uh, follow the Holy Father's lead and pray to Our Lady, undoer of knots, because uh, she, she could maybe yeah. take care of some of this stuff for us as yeah, well. Well, I, think, I agree. Because right? it's amazing yeah, how I agree. we tie ourselves up. It was another quick article I just wanted to allude to before we get to the questions. It was entitled, U.S. Catholic Bishops Aren't Playing Politics with Communion, Biden Is, and obviously that's a perspective. But this is a, a quote that was in here that I wasn't really familiar with. It went back to 1974. The Vatican Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith issued the Declaration on Procured Abortion, which they ratified on the 28th, so, uh, so right around mm -hmm. now of that year by Paul VI. It states plainly, it must in any case be clearly understood and this is 1974, that whatever may be laid down by civil law in this matter, man can never obey a law which in itself is immoral. And such is the case of law would admit people in principle the licity of abortion. Then it goes on to say, and I thought this was, nor can he take part in a propaganda campaign in favor of such a law or vote for it. And that's where I think you're really moving into where we are today, going from this yeah. kind of phony well, I'm personally opposed stuff to being mm -hmm. uh, I never met an abortion I didn't like or shouldn't be available. So you're moving really into mm -hmm. exactly what Paul VI was talking about here, the idea of promoting it. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that document right. myself. Um, but, of course, it makes perfect sense if it's murder. Oh, and why would a Catholic, um, you know, be able uh, to licitly promote this publicly, why would you do that? I mean, why would the Catholic Church have said, well, we're going to go ahead and, and um, uh, make licit uh, you, you can be personally opposed uh, to, to killing off uh, gypsies and Jewish people. Mm -hmm. But, of course, if you want to become a good politician and vote for it um, in your legislature, uh, go right ahead because you're personally opposed. Well, of course the church was not going to do that. So, And, of course, it makes perfect sense now that we're not going to do, um, you know, uh, uh, make licit mm -hmm. uh, the, the murder of innocent human beings just because they happen to be in the womb. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, um, I'm, I'm right. afraid, uh, you know, all the other excuses about not this and not that will never work 
uh, all we can do basically is to say this is who the human being is. We know them to be a full, unique, specifically human being and uh, we have to defend that life. We have to defend those people uh, in their, their right to liberty as well in the case of slavery. We have to defend those people in the case of uh, you know, a, a regime that wants to kill them arbitrarily simply because uh, they have been defined as subhuman by Hitler or somebody else. Right. Uh, we have to defend them and always defend them even if people get downright mad at us. And there's no such thing as making a distinction between personal opposition on the one hand and <laughs> running a political campaign right. you know, to what? To, to, to kill gypsies? To, to enslave a black people? I'm not in favor of enslaving Indians, just in favor of enslaving black people or vice versa, right. you know, which was of course the excuse of many colonists at the time. Wait a minute, you know, I, I draw the line at enslaving Indians, but well, you know, I mean, black people, they, they're coming from a, a, a foreign place. Why not enslave them? Right. You know, they're not citizens of, uh, you know, of, the, uh, of uh, uh, these colonies or citizens of the New World, et cetera, et cetera. Well, yeah. So, I mean, we've heard I'm all the excuses like you said, I'm not, I wouldn't own anybody. I wouldn't do it. But I think we should make yeah. all the rules to make it as easy as possible for everybody else to do it because I don't want to hold yeah, anybody yeah. back. And that's, yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't want to hold back my friends. Yeah, you right. know, I'm, I'm trying to be compassionate. They need farm workers and miners, and you know, we. <laughs> I mean, after all, what's a little exploitation? There I you mean, go. Uh, uh, the, these people, you know, they don't have our culture. We, mm. they're, they're exploitable. Right. Why not? Right. You know, exactly. it's for the sake of good convenience. Here's mm -hmm. a question. Uh, we're going to get into our questions. So, so we went to one that came up last week where uh, you answered mm -hmm. the question from last week concerning children of divorce and you yeah. talked about a book mm -hmm. which I think you indicated mm -hmm. was Between Two Worlds, The Inner Lives of Children of Divorce by Elizabeth Marquardt. Elizabeth Marquardt. And mm -hmm. what was it about yeah, that, that book that, remind us that uh, that you thought was so good? Well I just thought she had done uh, a, a series, a wide range of case studies mm -hmm. of the children of divorce and she really just lays it out there. Uh, and, and her basic thought was, ironically, uh, you know, it was a, trying to confront, you know, the old propagandistic expression, well, you can have a good divorce. Mm -hmm. And she goes, well, from the vantage point of children, there really isn't a good divorce. There's always going to be the, the price you have to pay. Mm -hmm. Now, in some cases, of course, a person is con you know, confronted with abuse in a marriage and terrible kinds of things, and it's almost, you know, the... The, 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 the solution that, that is, you know, the lesser of two evils. Mm -hmm. But the idea of a good divorce, uh, says Elizabeth Marquardt, uh, is basically a myth. And she just lays out case study after case study of very different kinds. Mm -hmm. And just basically says, there's one universal opinion you can have after all of these case mm -hmm. studies. What's so good about divorce? From the vantage point of children, mm -hmm. it, it's just not good mm -hmm. and so um, anyway I just thought well it was laid out well but right. she gets into the specifics and she sees it from the vantage point through the eyes of the kids right. uh, and oftentimes it's you know the divorces looked at well you know what's going on in the minds and hearts of the adults she just does the reverse right. what's going on in the minds and hearts of the kids um, you know and, and of course the adults come into play but mm -hmm. but uh, in the case studies but but they definitely the perspective is the kids right and it's important because hopefully that would make people think even more so before they take yeah. that step unless you're in this kind of a situation where there's a physical situation and where there needs to be a separation oh, yeah. just to protect somebody's yeah. uh, person so to speak here's yeah, uh, either the kids right. or the or the spouse yeah. right absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely Dear Father Spitzer, mm -hmm. uh, thank you so very much for all you teach us on your show. I'm so happy when I get to watch it. Everything you teach clarifies what I've learned as a child and how it applies to life in today's world. I just wanted to take a moment to let you know how very important your teaching is to me, especially in today's world. This is from Angie. I'd second that from all of our oh, audience as well. But, gee, thanks, but, uh, Angie. Great. Well, I wanted to give you a softball up front so you can get ready for the high hard one here. Uh, <laughs> okay, here's the high hard one. Okay. <laughs> Dear Father Spitzer, uh, I watch your programs on a, regular, on a regular basis, find your commentary very informative and inspiring. However, I was taken aback when a viewer asked about critical race theory and whether it was similar to Catholic teaching. Yeah. 
on the subjects of race and social justice. Instead of coming right out and saying that CRT is a Marxist doctrine dressed up for 21st century, you mentioned that parts of it were compatible with Catholic social teaching when it came to social justice. I was disappointed in your acceptance of any of this hateful doctrine. In pointing out that parts were compatible with the Catholic teaching on social justice, you inadvertently linked this hateful program with Catholicism. Thank you for your time, and may God continue to bless you as you endeavor to bring Christ to all with faith and reason. Jacqueline. Well, Jacqueline, I accept responsibility for um, whatever I might have done to <laughs> applaud, um, you know, the Marxist part of the of uh, critical race theory. And of course, it is basically um, a Marxist theory. I think you could use that label mm -hmm. um, uh, of it. You could also say definitely. Um, it, it has a, a kind of a postmodern tinge to it, and of course, it tries to justify um, a, a series of actions that we might call, uh, you know, not only socially questionable but socially violent mm -hmm. uh, in many ways. And of course, it has components that falsify history and uh, intentionally uh, try to. Uh, provoke people to radical solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these things are negative drawbacks to critical race theory. Um, and uh, I certainly didn't mean to applaud critical race theory. Mm -hmm. I just meant to say that I can understand, um, you know, th that people kind of move into this radical uh, uh, form. Uh, I see what they're what they're trying to do, but. My, I hope my point was very clear. Right. They're doing it in the wrong way. Right. I mean, whenever you turn to a Marxist theory uh, or even a socialistic uh, uh, viewpoint to try and justify mm -hmm. something, um, you know that that doesn't require uh, going that far. Uh, it's certainly not to the ownership of people, to the control over educational establishments, to the rewriting of history, uh, you know, in a uh, very skewed way, and, and of course to the forcing of this upon students and the educational system. I, I'm not in favor of any of that. Absolutely. And I, right. I certainly didn't mean to imply right. that I was in favor of no, it. No, I think uh, so what happens with some of these <laughs> things, as we know, is that, you know, as somebody once uh, said, you know, uh, a rat poison's 90% cereal. You know, the reality yeah. is is that you can have things that have pieces in them that sound okay, but yeah. if in doing that you're doing it for the wrong reasons, or like you said, I mean, it's a racist mentality in the sense that yeah. you're basically discriminating against people to make up for past discrimination instead yeah, of working exactly. to get rid of all discrimination, right? Yeah, and even trying to, you know, as I said, the, you know, whenever you've got the, the rewriting of history to conform to an agenda, that's automatically problematic. Mm -hmm. Whenever you have also, uh, you know, social methods and governmental methods that are meant to enforce, uh, you know, a doctrine that is clearly questionable in many regards, to enforce it within the educational system or mandate it in kind mm -hmm. of governmental practices, that is clearly problematic on mm -hmm. the highest levels. And, and so if I um, implied that CRT was something um, good, no. I No, I don't you know, think I you were at all. I, th I think you were responding yeah. to a specific question that said, are there aspects yeah. of the way it's presented that sounds mm -hmm. like it could jive with certain Catholic social teaching. Oh, and of social course, teaching, it, yeah. right. So if yeah. you throw in what they talk about with, you know, this is designed to help poor people or people be yeah. oppressed. Well, certainly the Catholic Church is in favor yeah. of helping poor people and helping people be oppressed. Yeah, But absolutely. not through this methodology, yeah. obviously. Yeah, no, and I would have never implied it, and I didn't absolutely. mean to imply right. it, but obviously I, I probably said it the wrong way. So uh, good point, Jacqueline. And, right. uh, um, justifiably um, uh, pointed out. Thank well, you. well, it's always good to clarify. That's all we want to do. Make sure yeah, people absolutely. understand what we're saying. If you don't <laughs> understand, send us that, or you misunderstand, or maybe you yeah. heard something and it didn't make sense, yep. or maybe we said it's misspoke. Let us know and we'll try and get yep. to it. Uh, one last question before we take the break. Uh, Dear Father Spitzer, I've been teaching pre-confirmation classes using themes from the seven essential modules along with our mm -hmm. usual CCD program. The children are really okay. enthusiastic and interested in the subjects. We know that God does not send anyone to hell, but in Jesus' parable about the wheat and the darnel, 
Uh, he said that uh, Darnell will be cast into the furnace of fire by the angels and in the parable of the sheep and the goats talks about eternal punishment. Both of these parables convey an idea of retribution instead of self-exclusion. How can we reconcile the two, Tim? Well, Tim, here's the, the, the thought is, yeah, Jesus is not um, generally um, into retribution uh, and certainly doesn't try to append retribution to God. Um, basically, the catechism definitely has the right view, mm -hmm. the right interpretation of these passages. And by the way, uh, you know, they're way above my pay grade. So uh, the, the catechism is always a great place to turn. And the catechism does call hell um, uh, the, uh, a self-exclusion, right? Mm -hmm from the, the kingdom of God. And I think that's correct, and I think that represents what Jesus' view is, because we're free human beings. Mm -hmm. God is willing to forgive us um, as long as we want to be forgiven, as long as we want to have a change in life. God, even to the ninth hour, is willing to forgive. The ninth hour right. is the last hour of the day to bring in the, the uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the laborers, you know, if you want to convert at the last mm -hmm. minute, uh, as Jesus says, okay, right. you know, the Father would absolutely take that, but it's not a good practice because you're going to have to want to convert. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to want to change your life as well as want forgiveness. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that idea of the willingness to convert, right. um, it's really going to be hard at the ninth hour, much better at the first hour. Uh, to, to do that kind of thing. And it's much easier and you're much freer. Uh, you haven't got, gotten down the road to perdition really far where the habits are there, the addictions are there, where it's really hard to turn around. Nevertheless, the idea that, you know, because you, you, you know, there are wordings in scripture that could be interpreted that way, you mm -hmm. know, that they'll just, uh, you know, they'll be burned. Uh, you, you could interpret it as retributive action mm -hmm. on the part of God. But it's really, that's the place that people have chosen. That's right. what they want. And Jesus is stern about this, and he gives a very rough rhetoric because he's warning us. Right. He's trying to tell us in Absolutely. no uncertain right. terms. You keep going down this road, it's going to be really hard for you to get off it. You are cooperating with a dark master, mm -hmm. and he is exceedingly effective mm -hmm. at getting you addicted to where he wants you to go until he brings you under his power. And then when you try to turn around, it's going to be very, very hard indeed. Right. And, and so the, uh, again, the idea um, behind it is, is a stern warning, no question. Right. But the idea that, um, that uh, Jesus is, uh, well, is uh, in a sense, he's, al he's, al he's alerting oh, right. people to the fact that they're yeah. Their decisions have an impact, and they can decide oh, yeah. if they make the wrong decisions, effectively excluding themselves, it's going to have repercussions. And I'm going to have to take a yes. break, or we'll get more repercussions from <laughs> the control room. Uh, much more with Father Spitzer as we continue to explore his universe. Stay with us. And welcome back as we continue in Father Spitzer's universe talking about our topic, which is coming up momentarily, basically Jesus defeating Satan during the temptations in the desert. That's a section in Father's wonderful book with Satan in our daily lives, which we was following throughout uh, the course of the program, naturally available through our EW10 Religious Cattle. A couple of questions here before we get to our okay. topic and continue on with seeing how our Lord does in the desert there. We've got Dear Father Spitzer, if Roe versus Wade is overturned by the Supreme Court, individual states will determine the abortion laws within their borders. What will be gained mm -hmm. by this being overturned? If by a miracle all 50 states ban abortion, that will be done with the excess babies. What will be done, I love this line, I have to stop. What will be done with the quote unquote excess babies that will be available for adoption? What if there were a worldwide ban? So far there have been more than 20 million abortions this year. That's a lot of excess babies to care for. Ryan, I, and, and the well, emphasis is mine. But. Yeah, 
<laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> Ryan, um, there's a line from good old Scrooge mm -hmm. um, in, right. um, in the Christmas Carol where he talks about, you know, um, a surplus population. population. Right, right. And uh, so remember uh, the there, these uh, poor fellows are coming up and mm -hmm. saying, oh, Mr. Scrooge, would you like to give something to help the poor people? Mm -hmm. And he goes, well, no. No, I pay taxes, don't I? I? I therefore support the jails and I support the workhouses and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I've done my part. And they go, but most people would rather die than go to those places. At which point Scrooge says, yeah, well, let them die. Uh, we'll get rid of the surplus population. So the idea of excess babies is a very, very, very almost immoral idea. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as an excess baby. Mm -hmm. That is, a, you know, a human being of uh, invaluable worth made in the image and likeness of God. And so every single baby is never excess. Every single baby has its own inestimable eternal worth in the eyes of God. And to destroy it is literally to destroy uh, God's own uh, handiwork in, in giving that baby a soul. So the first thing is, yeah, that's that's a bad phrase to use. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Scroogean right, uh, uh, justification yeah, for, uh, right. for yeah, exactly, <laughs> for, uh, ba well, basically annihilating human beings. Mm -hmm. The second thing uh, that, that has to be considered is, first of all, well, yeah, adoption. Uh, how's adoption going these days? Well, basically, the, the lists of, for adopting babies are so huge, mm -hmm. even internationally, uh, we, we are literally trying to get babies from everywhere around the world, from China, from Russia, mm -hmm. from any place that will allow it, uh, to some extent from uh, Africa, from, from countries that will allow it. Uh, people can't get any babies in this nation. Well, uh, uh, very few anyway. They can get some, but mm -hmm. very few uh, in any case. So we have and we need uh, thousands upon thousands of babies to right. be adopted. A and secondly, uh, if we really did have all those babies, do you think that they would all be put up for adoption? Or do you think that the mm -hmm. parents would actually try to care for those babies. That is, after all, a, a, another option mm -hmm. uh, besides putting them up for adoption. Uh, many parents would keep those babies, and those babies would become the love of their life mm -hmm. instead of just getting rid of them when you know maybe there's panic uh, there or right. maybe there's financial stress there. But it, we learn to love uh, in the midst of being in the presence of the, the deep mystery, which is the human being. Mm -hmm. It's hard to resist a child who absolutely is not only in need, but absolutely manifest the creator in the image of which that child was made. So uh, all I can say is there's plenty mm -hmm. of places for these babies to go. Right. And um, uh, you know, when, even before abortion uh, was present, you know, people just kept those babies. Mm -hmm. uh, of course they did, because those babies are quite, in many ways, irresistible. Once we get over the panic and the stress, mm -hmm. we see uh, the, the, the handiwork of God in them. Mm -hmm. uh, even, you know, sometimes they're imperfect. Sometimes right. they, you know, are crying a lot. And sometimes they, uh, you know, they do things that are, uh, uh, you know, unpleasant. But that's typical. I mean, we all have to put up with these things. We all have to put up with each other's um, imperfections. And by the way, it's only in the kind of contemporary psychoanalytic, uh, you know, uh, exaggerations. Not, I'm not saying psychoanalysis does this in general, mm -hmm. but I, I think there are certain, you know, psychologists that get out there and and basically say, well, imperfections in people should not be tolerated. Right. Uh, but that we, we're imperfect. We're sinners. We keep right. forgetting that. And if we could They're, just bring sin right. into psychology right. for right. two seconds, we'd have a realist psychology. Well, that's the, <laughs> you know, like you said, the imperfection, that's normal. It's, it's normal yeah. to be imperfect. It's not, yeah, you know, I mean, exactly. that's, that's the reality. If there, there, there is such a thing as normal. It's the average person yeah. who has a, the average imperfections and has to deal with them. The other thing I think was interesting, what you were talking about, even in you, for many years going to places like China or Russia, but certainly now China, 
is talking about expanding and mm -hmm. has already expanded its child policy to encourage more yeah. children being born there. Around the world, we're encouraging That's more right. people to be born. Where's Pearl? Where's Paul Ehrlich when we need him? And yeah. his yeah. Uh, exactly. right? How many yeah, years exactly. in the '60s did we hear about the population explosion, the population bomb? And that ties in too. Yeah. You still hear it in this kind of climate uh, change or climate hysteria, where you know, human beings are the problem. Yeah, well, um, I've got news for everyone that it's certainly Elon Musk and a lot of great researchers recognize in 2076, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to have a population implosion. Mm -hmm. We are not in danger of a population explosion out, you know, pacing our resources to handle them. As a matter of fact, as the population has been growing and growing, Technology has more than kept up with it, and uh, we now have a, a you know a, a gross national product, and we also have a per capita income that is now four times greater than it was when the population was much smaller 80 years, 70, 80 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and all of a sudden you go, well, you mean the, 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 uh, the per capita income is, is growing? Yes, the per capita income is growing all over the world, all over the world. And education is increasing all over the world. And resources are increasing all over the world. And if you start looking at all the, 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 uh, the goals uh, that were established by the uh, United Nations uh, Sustainability Council, right? There, there were a whole bunch of uh, millennial goals that were established by the United Nations. I mean, they have come so close to having, I mean, cutting in half the, the, uh, the, the poverty within the world, the, the uh, availability of, or the non-availability of water uh, has been, you know, cut back. The, 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 the starvation's been cut back. The dis number of diseases throughout the world have been cut back. Uh, you, you look at every single statistic, you know, kids who die at childbirth, kids, uh, you know, who are uh, dying within the first three years of existence, everything. All those statistics, we have come, you know, literally through these millennial uh, sustainability goals, we have come very close uh, to uh, cutting the world poverty rate in half while the so-called population has been exploding. Now, I, again, I, have, I can document all these figures for you. I can actually send them to... Um, you know, uh, if, if, uh, right. if to EWTN, if, if uh, uh, people want, and you can get them there on the website. The point that I'm trying to, to say is uh, this is the biggest myth there is. 2076 marks the point at which we begin uh, a process of population implosion, as Elon Musk said, and nobody seems to care about it. But the point is, once the implosion begins, in every single um, developed nation in this world, uh, in the world, we're going to see mm -hmm. that uh, there's going to be, the, the population of elderly people is going to be rising way above the population of uh, young people right. to provide the income and resources necessary to right. take care of that elderly population. More and more well, of the I, income I, right. of those young Right. Yeah, well, well, I tell you what's going to happen, and they'll, they'll take care of the elderly population by getting rid of it. That's what's well, going to well, happen. That's, Absolutely, That's what, was uh, what to take researchers are looking at, uh, yeah, <laughs> and, and of course, uh, yeah, rather than of course give up huge amounts of their income, mm -hmm. and it makes uh, what was that Soylent Green? Yeah, it's exactly uh, look like an interesting <laughs> proposition there that will go, likely right. come true. But yeah. the implosion is going to put right. pressure on. Uh, governments to quote unquote get rid of mm -hmm. uh, the older population because it will create such a financial stress. Mm -hmm. Of course there is the possibility of bringing in huge numbers of immigrants which is not a bad solution mm -hmm. uh, because we could bring them in but it's going to require huge amounts of expenditure to educate those immigrants mm -hmm. in the proper way and to try and uh, you know right. avoid social strife uh, between uh, the, the the melding of different cultures etc cetera, etc cetera. Right. so we are facing a huge problem and, and uh, by the way developing countries right now the population rate is going down in direct proportion to the education mm. uh, of those people and so all I can tell you is uh, be ready uh, the population explosion is not just a myth, it's going to become a reality in a few decades uh, that will be an implosion of a real considerable right. social strife.
Very good. Jesus' victory over Satan, page 94. Let's just jump in mm -hmm. in our last 10 minutes. You, you talk about the moment of uh, the devil leaves, Jesus the God-man has complete power and authority over Satan, and such has won a victory both in the heavens and on earth, a victory that will not only enable him to exorcise Satan and his demons by his very presence, and this was the interesting thing, we talked a little about this, but also give that same power to other men and women, his disciples. Mm -hmm. That's right, so Jesus now, um, he goes out and he's not just going to uh, uh, exercise the demons personally. He, he goes out and gives that authority uh, to exercise de uh, demons in his name to huge numbers of people. So we know that um, uh, it's not just the 72. We know that he's commissioning disciples hither and yon. And one of the powers he's giving is not just to heal the sick, but to exercise demons. And when his disciples come back and they go, Lord, even the demons, um, you know, um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. we have power even over the demons in your name. And Jesus finally has to correct him and say, don't be so impressed that the demons have power. Uh, you have power over the demons um, through my name, but rather that your names are written in the kingdom mm -hmm. of of heaven. Mm -hmm. So the, the point, of course, is get your priorities mm -hmm. right. Your power over demons is not the big deal. You're getting into heaven is the big deal. But yes, in the meantime, you do have that power in my name. Right. And don't forget the name uh, through whom you have right. the power. So um, that's the point. Okay. So as we uh, lower on the page, you make the point uh, that about mm -hmm. as part of Satan's temptation, the stakes are so high, he makes his bold move even though he's well aware of Jesus' identity as Son of God, a particularly bold move because he knows that if he loses in this first confrontation, he'll also lose the cosmic struggle uh, between himself and God. I thought it was interesting. You say the first confrontation. So is the assumption is that up until this point in time, the devil has never tried to tempt Jesus? Well, um, not explicitly um, in, in the way that is happening uh, after his baptism at the beginning of his ministry. I think um, uh, the implication, of course, from the, the vantage point of the, the evangelist, the, the people who wrote the, the apostles who wrote the scriptures, right, that the, the implication is that he's kind of bided his time mm -hmm. until, um, you know, he can out and out, you know, confront him. Mm -hmm. And so he does, and uh, no doubt about it, he's in the desert there. Uh, there's no question that uh, the evil spirit comes and he's decided this is going to be the point at which um, uh, he's going to um, present himself with mm -hmm. all of his goods uh, that he thinks will tempt Jesus into disobedience uh, of his father. So the main mm -hmm. sin that the devil wants more than anything else is that Jesus disobey his father. Mm -hmm. and, and people think, well, really, it's about power. Yes, it is about power. Uh, you know, here, I'll give you all the cities in the world and so forth. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, and, and of course, yes, it, it's about bread, right? It's about, you know, getting, uh, um, you know, uh, my sensorial desires fulfilled. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that, that's true. But really, it's about disobedience. Mm -hmm. Everything that's going on in, finally, of course, the spiritual pride at the end. You know, here, I, go ahead, throw yourself down from this tower. You know, no problem. You know, he, your father, you know he's going to send his angels, you know, to, 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 uh, to protect you. Mm. It's not really about spiritual, it is about spiritual pride, but it's more than that. It's disobey your father's will. Right. That's the point. And today, of course, people think, well, disobedience, you know, what's so wrong with mm. a little disobedience? I disobeyed my parents, you know, mm. and I mean, what do you mean, a strict obedience to the moral teaching of Jesus? What's that all about? You know, you know, you know, anachronistic. You know, we've surpassed all that. We now it's have an enlightened culture. It's an, it's an culture. ideal for yeah. us to, <laughs> yeah, to strive right. for as best we can. That's right. <laughs> but uh, I think it's always good to keep in mind that the real sin that the devil wants to get out of all of us is disobey mm -hmm. Jesus, disobey the Father. That's what I want you to do because when you disobey, you separate. Go mm -hmm. ahead, rationalize your disobedience because the more you rationalize it and make it look good, the more you basically say is that Jesus' teaching really has no value in my life. 
or the church's teaching, which is the interpretation of Jesus' teaching, has no value in my life. Mm -hmm. And that's what he wants more than anything. He doesn't just want you to disobey. He wants you to try and make it look good in your own eyes. Mm -hmm. He really wants you to try and rationalize it. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the unfortunate part is that the culture has become super experts at doing the rationalization for you. Mm -hmm. And in this case, our young people especially get sucker punched every which way into believing the propaganda, particularly when people they look up to, like their teachers, give them the cultural propaganda as if this is the truth. Mm -hmm. It is at this juncture that parents have to be the best teachers of the faith, is to say, wait a minute, let's examine this statement that you have been given at school. Is it really okay mm -hmm. to just have sex as long as it's safe sex? Is that really an okay statement? Well, what does Jesus have to say about this? Mm -hmm. Do you think that Jesus is just an anachronism? Do you really think that the culture is far more enlightened? Do you really think that sex is so beautiful that Jesus has nothing to say about it? Well, if you do think that, then is Jesus really the Son of God and it's at this point that's why in our the seven essential modules which that viewer just brought up a, mm. a few minutes ago the, why it's so useful because when the kids really see you know oh my gosh all this evidence for Jesus that's not just written uh, large on the Shroud of Turin though certainly that mm. but in the external sources even of Jesus's miracle that were written by hostile sources uh, almost contemporaneous with Jesus and, and as you look at you know the miracles that have gone on at Lourdes and Fatima and and you know the Eucharistic miracles etc you start looking at all these things and you build that preparation up it's really hard to deny mm -hmm. that Jesus is the Son of God risen in his glory and when you get to that point Jesus does have something to say about this this isn't just a story in the scriptures about the temptation Jesus really did liberate us mm -hmm. from Satan starting at that point Right. And it really did give us the power over Satan in his name, which power of exorcism still is a very powerful and necessary force in the world today. Not, it's certainly through the power of, of, of sacred orders, yes, but also in deliverance ministries as, as well. We can mm -hmm. see this uh, power in Jesus' name manifest. This is not just a story. This is very real power. And if you've ever experienced the darkness of that power, mm -hmm. the dread evil of that power. I assure you, when you see the name of Jesus and how it holds power over that power, then you know, hey, this is not just some story. This is very real. Jesus did, in fact, give that power uh, to his apostles. But the, the point is we've got mm -hmm. to make sure that our kids not only uh, uh, see uh, Jesus as Yes, he is the Son of God in glory. He really did give this power to his apostles. But the devil is also real. And that reality, and we can't pull punches. Mm -hmm. You can't just simply try to honey coat over the devil. I've actually had uh, teachers tell me, you mean you really expect me uh, to, to teach? These kids have more than enough problems already. I, I, I just can't go out there and teach them about the devil. Okay, that makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, there's cars out there, and I just don't want to burden my kids with more rules like don't run across the street before looking. You know, that it's just too much for them. They got enough problems already. <laughs> So you, you're not going to tell them about the enemy that seeks their soul, that pursues them? You're not going to tell them uh, uh, about that because mm -hmm. they have enough problems already? Maybe most of the problems they have are in some way incipiently caused by that force of evil. Right. Maybe it is good to recognize this. Maybe it's good to get the whole picture instead of partial picture. Let's stop the honey coating in this crazy culture of ours. Honey coating is, what, is not what's needed. The only thing that will help us is truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. That is what will help us. And so again, at the end of the day, right. um, you know, we have to give the kids a good solid foundation for seeing the reality of evil, the reality of divine power, and at the same time right. uh, for um, uh, being able to uh, 
to get these right. kids uh, over to mm -hmm. a, a point where they recognize the devil and see, okay, right. what can I do to avoid this? Jesus Christ and the church, which has the sacraments of reconciliation and the Holy Eucharist, right. that's the way to avoid this. Well, it's interesting, too, because to quote the old 60s, it, it's a cop-out. It's a reality that it's actually mm -hmm. easier on me for the, as the teacher not to mm -hmm. bring the truth down because I'll get pushback on that. So it works out for everybody. Yeah. I sugarcoat it for them, it's sugarcoated for me, and we all get along mm -hmm. and move on. And speaking of moving on, we're out of time, so if you'll uh, oh, give absolutely. us your blessing, Father, that'd be great. Bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. May the Lord of all consolation and peace, who is also the Lord of truth, and even the Lord of the truth of the cross, bless you with the full acceptance and desire to obey his will so that you may not only experience the eternal kingdom of heaven with him, but may lead others to do so. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much, Father. We shall see you next week as we continue on. And just a reminder, Father Spitz's books are all available, DVDs, etc. EW10's religious catalog. Next week we continue on talking about our Lord's temptations. And speaking of temptations, you could check out uh, the Master Psychologist, Listen to Him book, Jesus the Master Psychologist, by Dr. Ray Garendi, a, a tempting read. You can check that out as well. And here's a, a powerful program, A Church in Crisis, based on the popular book by Ralph Martin, continuing all this week and Friday, June 25th at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Check it out. Also, we'll be bringing you the Bicentennial Mass for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati from the Cathedral Basilica of St. Peter in Chains in Cincinnati, Ohio. Naturally, Thursday, June 24th, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Everything going on in the Catholic world you can find somewhere on EWTN or its website. And we shall see you next time when we once more enter Father Spitzer's universe. Hope to see you then.